It is a pleasure for me to introduce Fernando Coda Marquez. As you can see, he is a very young mathematician which has already done an impressive work. He was an invited speaker at the International Congress of Mathematics in of Mathematicians in 2010, and he has been awarded the Ramanujan Prize, the Umalka Prize, the Tuas Prize for his outstanding contribution to differential geometry. Fernando Coda, with his co-authors, has solved long-standing problems, in particular the Wilmore conjecture, which is the theme of his talk today. Okay, uh, thank you, Katy, for your nice words. Uh, let me say it's a great pleasure to be here. So this is a wonderful conference that I have been attending ever since I became a professor here at IMPA, so 10 years ago. So it feels really great to be here. Okay, so, uh, so today I'm going to, to talk about uh, a, a classical conjecture in differential geometry, namely the Wilmer conjecture, and, and about the solution that we found to the conjecture together with Professor Andre Neves from Imperial College in the UK, a solution that's based on, on the theory of minimal surfaces. Um, so, so the Wilmot conjecture is classical because it's a question about surfaces in three space. Uh, and it's, it's kind of ideal for this, for this general audience because it's, going, it's, it's very simple to, to understand the statement. So if you want to uh, motivate the question intuitively, the question is what is the best torus of R3. So for, for the layman, one can ask what is the best donut, for example, if you want. And that's going to, to have a precise, uh, precise uh, mathematical, mathematical sense. And as I said, we, we proved this conjecture using the theory of, of minimal surfaces. So there was always some, some relation between the Wilmer problem and minimal surfaces. But what we, so what we found was you know, a precise connection between uh, both roads, and, and, and this connection is, is through this keyword that I wrote there, is through so-called MIMEX theory. So let me, so I'll, I'll motivate the problem, uh, then I'll talk a little bit about its history, and then I'll, I'll try to, you know, say a few words about, about the solution. And towards the end, I want to mention some, some new results that we are excited about. So if time permits, I'll mention some new results in the end. All right, so let's get started. Okay. So one starts by fixing an abstract closed surface of, of genus G. So for example, if the genus is zero, then we are talking about the topological sphere. If the genus is one, then the surface is a two-dimensional torus, and so on. You can also talk about higher genus surfaces. So you fix one of these topological models, and then you ask the question, what is the best realization of such surface into Euclidean three space? Here we're talking about emergence. So, so if the genus is zero, then it's natural to think of round spheres. So the round, the round sphere is obviously the most elegant shape that a topological sphere can assume in Euclidean three, three space. But then if you ask the question, what is the best torus, what is the most beautiful torus of Euclidean space, then the answer is not so clear. And then we have to find some precise mathematical formulation for the problem. And for that, we, we, we need differential geometry. Okay, so, so recall that the geometry of a surface in Euclidean three space is described by these two numbers, the so-called principal curvatures, K1 and, and K2. So those numbers are obtained in the following way. So you have your surface in space. You have a point P on the surface. Then you pick, you look at the perpendicular direction to the surface. So there are several planes containing that direction and passing through your point. Each plane intersects the surface in a planar curve. So you can look at the curvature of, of such a curve. And as the plane varies, you get different curvatures. So then you take the, the maximum curvature and the minimum curvature, and those are called the uh, 
the principal curvature. So those, those numbers describe the local geometry of the surface in R3. And then out of those two numbers, you can define, you can do two things. So those are the classical definitions of curvature in differential geometry. One can take the average of K1 and K2, and that's called the mean curvature. And we, one can also consider the product of K1 and K2, and that's the, the Gauss curvature. So somehow, uh, we want to answer this question, what is the best torus of R3? Then if you think a little bit, it's natural to try to find some, some natural quantity that you would like to maybe minimize over the class of all tori in R3. So you want to set up some interesting uh, variational problem. And if you want to minimize, then it makes sense to, to look for a problem that has this property that, so the problem should be scale invariant. So you, you're basically interested in the general shape of your surface. So, so you, want, you want to find some interesting energies which have this scale invariant property. And if you think about how, the, how these principal curvatures vary under, <coughs> under scaling, you immediately see that what's natural to do is to integrate some expression that is quadratic on the principal curvatures. So in doing so, you, you'll get a, a scale invariant quantity. We already have one here that's the Gauss curvature, but if we integrate the Gauss curvature over a closed surface in R3, then this follows from the famous gauss bonnet theorem that this always gives you the same number. This is always equal to 2 pi, the Euler characteristic of the surface. Right? So this is not interesting for our purposes because it doesn't distinguish between different, uh, different shapes assumed by the same topological type. But there's something else you can do. One can integrate the square of the mean curvature. So that's, if you want, that's the most natural scale invariant geometric quantity that one can consider, and that's called the Wilmore energy of a surface sigma. So let me, let me maybe draw a picture here. So we're talking about surfaces in R3, closed surfaces. So maybe the surface has some genus. Then recall that the Wilmore energy of the surface is just the integral of the mean curvature squared. Okay, so, so it turns out that this number is not only invariant under scalings, but it's actually invariant under the full group of conformal transformations of R3. So it's very easy to see that this quantity is invariant under translations and rotations, also scalings because of the quadratic property, but it's also invariant under inversions. So it's actually invariant under the full group of conformal transformations, including inversions if you want, and that, that was already known by, you know, by Blaschke and Thompson in the early 1920s. So it's a very special quantity, very natural in conformal geometry, if you want. Uh, this is sometimes called bending energy in the literature, and it, it appears in some, in some physical context. For example, it, appear, it, it appears in the early 1800s in the work of Sophie Germain and Poisson, uh, the, their work in elasticity to describe Elastic, elastic shells. So let me just mention that, I, you know, for those who are interested in history, apparently there is some, some kind of interesting history be behind, um, behind this work. So I think in the early 1800s, the Paris Academy of Sciences, uh, uh, they, 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 you know, they established a, a contest. So the, the challenge was to develop some mathematical theory for, for elasticity that would explain some experiments that were done at the time with vibrating metal plates. So that was the, the challenge. And after you know, hard work, Sophie Germain was able to, to, to solve the problem. So she submitted the paper, and eventually she, she won the, the contest through her work on elasticity theory. So it's, it's kind of interesting the story here because Poisson was also somehow involved. And in mathematical biology also appears in the so-called Helfrich model uh, as one of the terms that contribute to the energy of cell membranes. Okay, so it's a more modern um, physical situation, I guess. Okay, so, so the subject was reinitiated by, by Wilmer in the 1960s who managed to prove the following results. So he proved that 
the Wilmot energy of any closed surface in 3 space is always greater than or equal to 4 pi. And 4 pi is precisely the energy of round spheres. Actually, he also proved the rigidity case. So if your surface has energy equal to 4 pi, then your surface must be, must be a round sphere. So that's a, a very interesting result. And then he asked himself, what, what if now uh, we fix the topological type? So what is the, you know, what if I ask, what is the minimizer if the surface has genus equal to 1? So he made a conjecture. So that became famous as the Wilmer conjecture, proposed in 1965. So he says that the integral of the square of the mean curvature of a torus immersed in R3, in other words, its bending energy, or Wilmer energy if you want, should be always at least 2 pi square. Right? So that was, that was the conjecture. And in order to get to, to this prediction, what he did was the following. Uh, he considered... Um, Tori of revolution with a circular section. So you, you look at the xy plane, uh, then you draw, you, know, you draw a circle in the xy plane, then later you, will, you, won't, you rotate that circle around the y-axis, say. So in that, for that particular class of Tori, he was able to find the minimizer. So you have to choose the ratios correctly. So if the distance from the center of the circle to the axis is the square root of 2, then, then the radius must be 1. So if you choose these two numbers, then you generate the torus of revolution, which I denote by sigma square root of 2. And the energy of that guy is precisely equal to, to 2 pi square. So he predicted that that's, that's the best donut, if you want, in Euclidean 3 space. But remember that the functional, you know, the functional had this property that it's conformally invariant. So if f is conformal, remember, then the Wilmot energy of its image, of the conformal image, is just the same as the Wilmot energy of the original guy. In particular, you can apply inversions to your, to your torus, so you get different shapes with energy equal to, 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 to 2 pi square. In fact, let me say that uh, two students of mine, two PhD students of mine, Lucas and Raphael, they're probably somewhere there in the audience. So they were in Park City uh, two weeks ago for a school in differential geometry. And then they brought me a little surprise here. So they brought me a little gift. So they brought me this. <laughs> so apparently there was a 3D printer in Utah. So, so they were able to generate a conformal image of, of the Clifford Torres. So this is a new world. Huh? <laughs> so it's kind of, you know, if you apply this inversion, it's kind of, it looks kind of cooler than the just the revolution guy. Anyway, thanks, Lucas and Raphael. Okay, so, right. So you might ask the question, why 2 pi square, right? So why 2 pi square is the optimal number? Well, the answer uh, is, is the following. In order to, to answer this question, one has to look at the stereographic projection. So the stereographic projection is a conformal mapping from S3 minus a point into Euclidean 3 space. And since the problem is conformally invariant, instead of looking at surfaces in Euclidean 3 space, we might as well consider surfaces sitting inside a three-dimensional sphere of radius 1, for example. So if you do that, if you, if you start from a surface sitting inside the 3 sphere, and if you consider its stereographic projection R3, then you can compute the, the energy of the projection, and then you get a formula you get integral of 1 plus mean curvature squared of sigma, where now the mean curvature here is computed with respect to the spherical geometry. So if you want, if you want to look at the problem from the point of view of S3, the 3 sphere, the Wilmot energy is given by, by this expression. So that's the point of view that I would like to adopt in this talk. So we have S3 instead. And then somehow we have a closed surface sigma sitting inside S3, then the Wilmot energy then is just the integral of 1 plus mean curvature squared. So the problems are completely equivalent because that's just you know, the reformulation of the bending energy in R3. So one can see that since the square of the mean curvature is always non-negative, one can see that this is always greater than or equal to the area of the surface. So the Wilmot energy dominates the area. So this is a, 
important observation because later one of the key ingredients in our proof it will be the, the fact that the Wilmore energy not only dominates the area of the original surface, but it actually dominates the area of a whole five-dimensional family of surfaces. I'll, I'll, I'll mention that later in the talk. Uh, but then if your surface is minimal, remember that minimal surfaces are those surfaces which are critical uh, for the area functional, so the, are those surfaces that, such that the first derivative of the area functional with respect to any variation is equal to zero, you know, this, the, the most natural variation problem one can think of, they turn out to be precise little surfaces with mean curvature equal to zero, and we know lots of minimal surfaces in S3. So if your surface happens to be minimal, then the way more energy is just the area, because this term drops out. So for example, the equator is a minimal surface, therefore its way more energy is just equal to the area, and then very easily you see that the area of the equator is equal to 4 pi. So 4 pi is the best number for spheres, remember. Uh, but we know another minimal surface. So the simplest minimal surface after the equator is called the Clifford torus. This is a product of two circles. So you choose the radii to be equal and so that the surface sits inside the unit 3 sphere. So this surface is a minimal surface in S3. And then since this is a product of circles, it's very easy to compute its area. It's just a product of the length. So the area is 2 pi squared. Therefore, its Wilmore energy is also 2 pi squared. And this is no coincidence, because if you, write, if you choose your stereographic projection right, the projection of the Clifford torus is going to be exactly that particular torus of revolution that I had in my previous slide. So, so, find, so, so the answer to the question, why 2 pi squared, could be, well, 2 pi squared is the area of the Clifford torus, which is a very special minimal surface in S3. OK, so let me mention a little bit about the history. So there are, se there, there are, there are several results on the problem. So in the early 70s, Wilmer and independently Shiohama and Takaji, they proved the conjecture for tubes. So you assume that you have some, some curve in space, then you take a, a tubular neighborhood of constant radius. You look at the boundary, that's a tube. So they verified the conjecture for this special class. Uh, in 1976, Langevin and Rosenberg proved that if your torus is knotted, in other words, if you cannot bring your torus to the standard position by ambient isotopies, then the Wilmore energy should be already bigger than 8 pi, which is better than 2 pi square. So this proves the conjecture for this class. So for example, I think this particular torus here is, is, seems to be knotted. Uh, then there's a very important paper by Peter Lee and Yao in 1982, where they introduced this notion of conformal volume, which had several applications in geometry. But in particular, this pro they, they proved this result, which is, which is useful for us. So they proved that if the surface is not embedded, in other words, if it has at least one self-intersection, then the Wilmore energy should be greater than or equal to 8 pi. So it's kind of a generalization of Wilmer's previous result. So Wilmer proved that the Wilmer energy of any surface should be at least 4 pi. Then they prove that if you have a self-intersection, it should be at least 8 pi. And then you can continue. So if you have a triple intersection, then the Wilmer energy should be bounded by 12 pi and so on. So that it's part of the, the, same, the same result. But since 8 pi is, is bigger than 2 pi square, right, that means that the conjecture is true for, for non-embedded surfaces. So if you want to prove the conjecture, one could assume, for example, that the surface is embedded. And that's what we're going to do um, later. That's what we do in the paper. Uh, right, in the same paper, they managed to prove the conjecture also assuming conditions on the conformal class of, of Eutorus. Uh, then Chen in 83 managed to prove the conjecture for the class of flat tori. I mean, it's a very rich class uh, in, the, in the three spheres. So here's the picture. So the, the pictures are all from, from the web. In 84, Langer and Singer proved the conjecture for, for Tarai of revolution, where now the section doesn't have to be circular anymore. Again, the, the, the conjecture is true. And in 86, Montiel and Ross, they improved the result of Liao. So, so they, they enlarged the set of conformal classes for which the conjecture is true. 
Uh, this is interesting. We, all, we, we only knew about this after we finished our paper, so we actually were contacted by these guys. That the conjecture is, ha, had been experimentally verified by these two people. So they kind of like, they had the steroidal vesicles observed under the microscope, and they sort of, you know, they experimentally proved the conjecture, if you want, the microscope. Uh, there, you know, there was a lot of activity around, around the problem, lots of beautiful results. For example, Leon Simon in 93 managed to prove the, an existence result that there exists one torus which achieves the minimum numbers. That, there exists one torus that's better than all the others. So that's an existence theorem. Uh, and in 1999, and independently topping in 2000, Tony Ross here in 99, they proved the conjecture for for tori and S3, which are invariant under the antipodal map, those two proofs are different. Somehow our proof is kind of like initially inspired by the paper of Ross. Okay, and as I said, there were, you know, there are sev several beautiful results. Uh, in fact, a week ago I was in Obervolfa at a meeting devoted to the, to the Wilmer function when there were several um, you know, interesting developments, for example, from people like Tristan Riviere and Ernst Kuvert on the analytical aspects of the variational problem. Anyway, let me just mention that Bryant classified uh, Wilmer spheres, so you, you, don't, you don't have to look at minimizers, so you can consider unstable critical points too if you want. So he managed to classify all those critical points that are topological spheres. And Pinkle in 85 found actually infinitely many critical points which have the topology of a torus. Here are some pictures. I think these two down here were found by, by Ferris and Pedit. But of course, they are all unstable critical points. None of them are minimizers. All right, so let me get to the, to the statements. So in the paper, by the way, the paper has been uh, accepted. You can access it through the, it's not yet published, but you can access it through the, through the website of the journal if you want if you're interested. So, so in the paper, we prove two theorems. We prove, again, this is joint work with Andre Nevis. So the main theorem is theorem A, which says that if sigma is an embedded closed surface in S3 with genus G assumed to be greater than or equal to 1, then its Wilmot energy is greater than or equal to 2 pi square. And equality holds if and only if your surface is the Clifford torus, maybe after conformal transformation. Right? So, of course, this theorem implies that the Wilmer conjecture is true. But it proves actually more because we managed to prove the 2 pi square bound for higher genus surfaces as well, which was not, was not known before. As I said, we're, we're going to use the theory of minimal surfaces. So, actually, we prove first a statement assuming that the surface is minimal. That's theorem B, which kind of look strange because theorem B looks like a corollary of theorem A, but it's important to prove theorem B first because we want to make this link with the theory of minimal surfaces. So theorem B says that if your surface embedded, close, but now it's minimal, if your surface is assumed to be minimal and has genus greater than or equal to one, then its area is greater than or equal to two pi square. Remember that the area for a minimal surface is just equal to the Wilma energy. And here, equality holds if and only if your surface is the Clifford torus, maybe after an ambient isometry, right? So it's important to prove theorem B first and then use theorem B to prove theorem A. Okay, so uh, a fundamental tool that we use in the proof is the so-called Mimex method. So let me start by illustrating it with a very simple example. So suppose we have a finite dimensional surface, let's say a surface shaped like in the picture, and then we are interested in finding the critical points of the height function, say. But it's very easy, usually it's very easy to find the minimum point. You can, just you can just pick a minimizing sequence of your function if you want, and hope that it converges. But it's not so easy to detect higher index critical points, the unstable ones. So remember that the index is equal to the number of negative eigenvalues of the second derivative. So if you want is the, is the maximum dimension of a parabola that you can draw there such that the function assumes a maximum point at its peak. So in, here in the picture, this critical point has index one, 
there is one direction which decreases the function. So in order to detect this critical point, what one can do is the following. So we look at loops which go into the hole, into the hole of your surface. Then we can consider you know, the class of all such loops, this homotope class, which I denote by pi. And then for each such loop, one look at the, at the soup of the height function, and then one tries to minimize this number over the class of, whole, over the class of loops. So that's the min-max approach. And by doing that, by sliding this, trying to minimize this maximum number, you eventually detect your critical point C1. So an important observation here is that it follows from most theory that if you want to find a critical point of index k, you need to do min-max over families with at least k parameters. So the index has to match the number of parameters, and that can be intuitively seen by, by looking, for example, at this example. If, if, you, if you have a, let's say this is a point with index 2, with the height function, and then somehow if you try to detect it using a one-parameter family, that's not going to do it because you can do better by going around, right? So the, because the index is higher than the number of parameters, you def can deform your family and it, the soup goes down. So the index has to match the number of parameters. And that's very important observation because, uh, as I said, we want to look at minimal surfaces, which are critical points for the area functional. So they come with an index, and it happens that the index of the Clifford torus is equal to 5. So if you want to you know, try to detect the Clifford torus by such a process, we need five parameters. So let me say uh, something about minimal surfaces. Minimal surfaces are critical points for the area functional. So somehow you should think that in this picture, this, is, this should be the space of all surfaces, and then the height function is replaced by the, by the area functional. The equator is the simplest minimal surface again with area 4 pi, and it turns out that it has index 1. You can push the equator up. That's one direction which decreases area. And in fact, the, the equator can be produced by minimax. What you do is the following. You look at S3, then now, instead of a curve of points, now you consider a curve of surfaces. In other words, you consider one parameter families of surfaces that sweep out the whole S3. So the surfaces are the red curves. So for each such sweep out, you look at the highest, you know, you look at the soup of the area function over, over such class, and then you try to minimize this number over the class of all sweep outs. So in other words, this number is the, is the least amount of area that you need to sweep out your, your manifold. And if, you're, if you run this, this process, you end up finding that the critical point that you detect is precisely the, the equator with area 4 pi. Uh, in fact, you, you can repeat this procedure for any compact Riemannian manifold. Given any compact, let's say, three-dimensional manifold, one can pick, let me, let me draw a picture here, so if you want to produce minimal surfaces in general manifolds, what you can do is the following. Maybe I should draw here. So if you have your manifold, let's say M, let's say this is three-dimensional, you can choose your favorite most function on your manifold, let's say going from 0 to 1. And then you can consider the level sets of this most function. And that's your sweep out. So every three manifold comes with a non-trivial sweep out. Of course, then after that, you have to consider all sweep outs which are equivalent to that one, which are in the same homotope class, and do minimax. So that's how you produce minimal surfaces in Riemannian manifolds. So, okay, so we saw that the equator can be produced by minimax methods. So the key question here that actually has everything to do with the Wilmer conjecture despite the fact that it doesn't appear to, to be so, is the following question. Can we produce the Clifford torus as a minimax minimal surface? So this is harder because the Clifford torus has index 5. So that means that we have to look for five-dimensional families. And by answering this question, we were able to, to see this connection with the Wilmer problem. So, so let me mention the ingredients in the proof now. So the first ingredient is the following. These five-dimensional families exist. 
So for any given closed surface sigma in S3, there's always a five-dimensional canonical family of surfaces that can be canonically constructed and very explicitly. This family is parameterized by parameters v and t, where v lives in the four ball, and t goes from minus pi to pi. So this family contains the original surface, and it has the property that the area of each surface in the family is bounded above by the Wilmot energy of sigma. So, so what I'm saying is that in the space of surfaces, given any surface sigma, I can always find some family here passing through sigma, such that if I look at the area function, this is always bounded above by the, this is always below the Wilmot energy of sigma. So this, as I said, they are obtained very explicitly. And actually, the, the area estimate here follows from a calculation of Ross in 1999. But it can be seen to follow from more general inequalities also, for example, heinz karker So such families exist. Then the second ingredient is that there's a characterization of the Clifford torus in terms of its index. So this is a theorem of Rubano from 1990 that says the following. If you have a minimal surface in S3 such that its index is bounded above by 5, there's no assumption on the genus, then Rubano's theorem says that this surface has to be either the Clifford torus with index 5 or the great sphere with index 1. So this is crucial in the proof. And finally, we need some Mimax theory that fits into our setting. So such theory exists. It's due to Elmgren and, and his student Pitts was finished around 1981 and uses a lot of geometric measure theory. So there is a MIMAX theory that applies to, to our setting. So at this point, I can mention what we had in mind when we were trying to, to, to solve the problem. So the idea was the following. So we have the surface in S3 for which we want to, to prove the Wilmer conjecture. But now we know that there is a five-dimensional family there passing through that surface such that the area is bounded above by the Wilmot energy. So we thought, OK, so maybe we can apply MIMAX to families which are homotopic to that, to that guy. So if we succeed in that process, we will find a minimal surface such that its area is bounded above by the Wilmot energy of sigma. And then we thought, OK, by Moore's theory, since this is a five-dimensional guy, maybe we can, we can prove that the index of the minimal surface that we found is bounded above by five. And if you do that, Urbano's result tells us that this surface has to be either the Clifford torus or the great sphere. And then we thought, OK, maybe if we're lucky, we'll be able to find some, some new topological idea that will rule out the possibility of getting great spheres. We don't want those guys. Those guys have lower energy. So if, you, if we succeed in, that, in doing that, that means that the surface that we constructed is the Clifford torus, but the area of the Clifford torus is 2 pi square. So that was the, that was the program that we, we had in mind. All right, let me maybe just formalize a little bit more the MIMAX theory. So here, uh, the domain space is the n-dimensional cube. So we will consider families which are defined in the n-dimensional cube and that take values in the space of closed surfaces in M. This is denoted by Z2 of M, but to, to be precise, uh, this is actually the space of integral two currents with boundary zero. That's the language of geometric measure theory. But let's just think that an object here is a smooth closed surface in, in the manifold. So we look at maps. Then we look at the homotope class of the map with uh, fixed boundary values, let's say pi. And then for each family in the homotope class of phi, for each phi prime in the class, we take the soup of the areas. That's called L of phi prime. And then, of course, we want to minimize this number over all families in the homotope class. That's the Mimax number, and we call, that's called the width of your homotope class. So there's a theorem which says that if the Mimax number is bigger than what happens on the boundary, that's very natural if you think of the mountain pass lemma. So if that condition holds, then this number is achieved by a minimal surface. Right? So that's smooth and embedded. So the minimal surface could be disconnected. It could come with integer multiplicities. 
So this area here is actually the area counted with multiplicities. But the point is that there is one minimal surface whose area equals the width. And that's how you prove that any compact Riemannian manifold contains at least one minimal surface. Right. And this is a, this is a remark. Let me maybe explain here by recalling the previous example. So when we're trying to do Mimax over this surface with the height function, right? So of course the Mimax number will be this critical value C1 of the critical point of index 1. And then if you, if you happen to have a family or a curve such that the family is optimal for the Minimax, in other words, such that the soup of the height function over this family is precisely the mean max number, then that means that this curve must cross the critical point at some point. Right? This is what the remark is saying. You're doing minimax if you have an optimal family, a family phi prime for which the soup is exactly the mean max number, then the surface, no, the family must cross the critical point at, at some point. It's a remark that will be useful later. Okay, I guess this is already explained. So finding minimal surfaces, you choose a Morse function. You look at the level sets. You take the homotope class relative to the, to the boundary. Uh, you prove that this is non-trivial, and that's how, you, that's how you find a minimal surface. So let me do an example here. So for each compact Riemannian 3 manifold, we have this one-dimensional minimax. So we have this number. And it's easy to see what happens for for S3 with the standard metric, because in S3 we have this family, very simple family, which is just the level sets of the height function, if you want. So, of course, the soup of the areas here is achieved at the equator with area 4 pi. But it turns out that the equator is the minimal surface with lowest area. So the number cannot be lower than 4 pi. So it means that the number is exactly equal to 4 pi. And that's an example of a canonical family. Sorry, an optimal family. So MIMAX theory tells us, just remember the, the previous remark, that you, if you happen to, to find a sweep out of S3 with a property that the soup of the areas is equal to 4 pi, then at some point you'll see a great sphere by this observation. This will come up later. OK, so let me just, just very briefly tell you how the, the canonical family is constructed. Maybe it's easier to, to draw a picture. So, so the idea is that you start with a surface sigma sitting inside S3. Then you see that for each vector v in the unit 4 ball, one can define a special conformal transformation, which is called a, a center dilation. So the space of center dilations is parametrized by a vector v inside the unit ball. So what, what the center dilations do is the following. So f0 is the identity. But if v is different from 0, then the geometry is the following. So you have the north and the south pole. And if you do stereographic projection with respect to this axis, this transformation is just a, it's just a dilation. So <laughs> as the vector v converges to the north pole, this conformal transformations will send everything else into the south pole. Just think of a dilation that sends everything to infinity except the origin, for example. This is just the same, the same thing, but written in terms of, the, of S3. Then for each such conformal transformation, you can, you can take the image. So you can apply, you can define sigma v to be the image of your surface under that. So you see that this is a four-dimensional family of surfaces. And then what one can do later is just to consider the equidistant surfaces, distance t. And that's your, that's your five-dimensional family. First, you apply a conformal transformation. Then you look at the equidistant surfaces. And you check that the area 
is bounded above by, by the Wilma energy of sigma. So we have our, our family now, which is defined, again, for a vector v in, the, in, in B4, and for a parameter t, which goes from minus pi to pi. Uh, the first difficulty, I'm not going to, to detail in that, but the first difficulty is to extend this family to the boundary of the parameter space. So in order to illustrate the, what's going on, one can think of a surface in R3, that, and then you start dilating the surface all the way to infinity. So there are two types of, of behavior. If your surface does not pass through the origin, then the sequence of dilations just vanishes at infinity. But if your, the surface that you started with happens to pass through the origin, then the origin is always going to be there. So as you start dilating, all the genus is going to die at infinity, but the origin is going to be there, so in the limit you'll see a plane. Right? And the plane, after you do stereographic projection, is just a great sphere. So you have these two kinds of behavior, so you need to be careful in reparametrizing the family. Uh, but that can be done, and, 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 and if you do that, what you discover is that when you take the limit as the parameters go to the boundary, the limits are always round spheres. And round spheres with different centers and different radii, but varying continuously with the parameter. So the boundary, the boundary we, always, we always see round spheres. So, so that's the parameter space. This is a solid cylinder. Let me explain then what's the boundary behavior. So the parameter space is a solid cylinder. This is B4, this is minus pi to pi. And then for each vector V in the three sphere, which is the boundary of B4, if you look at the surfaces along this vertical direction on the boundary of the solid cylinder, what you see what the surfaces are that they form a foliation of S3 by round spheres centered at some point, which of course depends on V. So the boundary of the solid cylinder is mapped onto the space of, of round spheres, and in the, in the top and in the bottom of the cube, we just see this, the trivial surface because Remember that this is the equidistant deformation, and in S3 there is nothing at distance pi. So that's the blue line. The blue line corresponds to a, to a foliation by geodesic spheres. And now comes a really, you know, really important breakthrough here in the process. So, so far we had uh, no clue about how we would eventually rule out the possibility of getting great spheres until we found this, this identity here. So the degree, the topological degree of the center map, which it tells you the behavior of the family on the boundary of the cylinder, is exactly equal to the genus of the original surface. So that was, you know, when, when, we, we, when we found that, we with, with immediately thought, okay, this is going to work, right? Because before that, we had no clue about how the genus was going to, to, play, a, to play a role. And it's interesting because in the cal we, we do that by, cal by calculating, and through the cal along the calculation, at some point, we need to know what is the volume of S3. So does, that, does anybody know what the volume of S3 is? Some people know, I guess. So this is 2 pi squared. Right? So exactly the same number that uh, one expects for the, for the Wilmer energy. So it was kind of like magic, if you want. So what this is saying is that if the genus of the original surface is non-trivial, then the boundary of the cylinder is being mapped onto the space of round spheres, but it's being mapped in a non-trivial way because the degree of the center map is non-trivial. So that's what makes the difference between a sphere and a torus, if you want. That's also the reason why in the main theorem we don't care if the surface is a torus. It could be a genus two surface or a genus three surface because the only thing that matters is that this number is non-trivial. Okay, let me summarize what we, we got so far. So we got a family defined on the solid cylinder, but one can, of course, the solid cylinder is homeomorphic to the five cube, 
so we can reparameterize things so that the family is now defined in the five dimensional cube. This is I, let's say this is I4 and this is I. So in the top of the cube, we see the zero surface. In the bottom of the cube, we also see the zero surface. And for each point X in the boundary of I4, the surfaces along this vertical direction are, again, round spheres. And we can conveniently reparameterize things so that the equator, the corresponding equator here, is always achieved at time one half. So in time one half level here, these guys are great spheres. Equators, if you want. So that's the behavior of the, of the family. Uh, and of course, the crucial, the crucial property here is that the center map has non-trivial degree. <laughs> All right, so here's an outline of the, of the proof. This is a rough outline because there are several details that you have to worry about. You start with a surface inside a three sphere with genus greater than or equal to one. Then we have this canonical family. So the area of the canonical family is dominated by the Wilmore energy of sigma. So we can apply MIMEX theory to the homotopy class of that guy. So by doing that, we find some minimal surface obtained by this MIMEX process, let's say sigma hat. And because of the area bound, the area of this minimal surface will be bounded above by the Wilmer energy of sigma. But then we have to prove that the surface cannot be a great sphere. And that requires a topological argument, which will use the degree calculation. Let me skip that for a moment. So for using, for, through a topological argument, we prove that this guy cannot be a great sphere. Hence, its genus is greater than or equal to one. So, so summarizing, by doing Mimax over the canonical family, if you start with some guy with non-trivial genus, you end with some guy with non-trivial genus also. So now what do we do? We pick the minimal surface of lowest area among all surfaces with genus greater than or equal to one. One can always do that. So the question is which surface that is. Let's say this is sigma one. And then we can apply this procedure to that particular surface. So the idea here is I guess I, I erase the example that I talked about before. Remember that if the index is bigger than the number of parameters, then you can avoid the critical point and you can do better, right? And here is exactly the same idea because we are working with this guy, sigma one, the minimal surface with lowest area, right? And the, and the Mimax that we, we're doing here uses five parameters. So if the index of that guy was greater than or equal to six, you could do better. But that's not possible because the surface is the one of, of lowest area. So that tells us that the index is bounded by five. But then recall by Urbano's theorem, sigma one has to be the Clifford torus. So that proves theorem B. In other words, it proves that the area of any non-trivial minimal surface must be greater than or equal to two pi square. And finally, Again, starting with the arbitrary surface now in sigma in S3, we can repeat this process. We can do minimax over the canonical family. We find a minimal surface sigma hat, whose area is, is dominated by the Wilmer energy of sigma. But now, just prove that this minimal surface is not a great sphere. So it means that its area must be greater than or equal to the area of the Clifford torus, which is two pi square. And that proves theorem A and the Wilmer conjecture. So that's, as I say, as I said, this is a very rough outline of the idea. So what's crucial here is that you have, we have to prove that the minimax minimal surface is not a great sphere. And that requires a topological argument that let me, let me explain very briefly here. So we want to prove that great spheres never appear in that process. And we do that by showing that the Mimax number that we get is never 4 pi. 
And the idea is the following. I will just illustrate the idea with assuming that we have a, an optimal family. So suppose that somehow we can find some optimal family of surfaces such that the soup of the areas is already for pi. So the proof is by contradiction. You assume that the number is for pi. And then you assume that you've somehow you found uh, an optimal family. Remember that the boundary behavior is fixed. It's just like that. So in the top of the cube, we see the trivial surface. In the bottom, we see the trivial surface. And here, the lateral sides, we see these this round spheres. But then what we do is the following. OK, so this is the parameter space. Again, the parameter space. So we consider curves which go from the bottom to the top. So if you think of the surfaces along such, such curve, since any path that goes from the bottom to the top is homotopic to a vertical path, the sweepout is a non-trivial sweepout of S3. So the, the surfaces along the red curve are sweeping out your three-dimensional sphere, but we are assuming that the soup of the areas is 4 pi, right? So that means that any red curve like that is an optimal family for the one-dimensional minimax problem. So at some point, it must cross a great sphere. So we use this information to produce a whole four-dimensional bunch of great spheres inside the family. So we construct a four-dimensional submanifold, which is the blue guy here, such that each surface in the submanifold is a great sphere. Of course, in the boundary, the great spheres are seen at the time one-half level. Remember that at the time one-half level, the great sphere is determined by its center, right? So at, at a, the surface, let's say at time one-half, is just the boundary of some ball with some center, ball of radius pi over 2. So you have the center here. Remember that the center have non-trivial degree because the genus of the surface was assumed to be greater than or equal to, to 1. And then the contradiction comes because look at what we did. We just extended the map to a four-dimensional guy. So, so if you look at the, so maybe let me just explain this better here. So the idea is that if you look at a round sphere, uh, a, t a great sphere in S3, this can be identified with its center. Right? So originally, our center map was only defined that at the time one half level. But now we just constructed a four dimensional guy whose boundary is equal to the time one half level and such that every surface here is a great sphere. So if you want, we just extended this guy to the four-dimensional thing. But this is, an, uh, this is a contradiction, because if you look at the image of this guy in, in homology, on the one hand, the image must be g times the fundamental cycle of S3. But on the other hand, since we just extended the family, this cycle is the boundary of something. And that's a contradiction, because, because the genus is assumed to be greater than or equal to 1. So that's, you know, that's a very, you know, it's a summary of what we, we do in the paper. So that's how the genus comes into, into play. Okay, so let's see, I have a few minutes. So let me mention some other results that we were able to prove using the minimax technique. Uh, so we were able to solve a problem in topology. So we start you look at now, instead of a surface in R3, you look at a pair of curves which are disjoint from each other. That's called a link. So a link comes with this invariant, which is called the linking number. And then it turns out that there is an energy for such links, which is defined by this very simple expression. That's called the Mabius cross energy. And it turns out that this number is also conformally invariant. This energy is also invariant under the conformal group. So we can ask the question, what is the best non-trivial link in R3? Right. So there was a, a conjecture in 1994 
by Friedman, Hay, and Wang. Uh, the conjecture was that if the linking number is plus or minus one, which is the simplest case one would consider, then again, the energy should be bounded below by two pi square. So if true, is that one can actually check that this is also true for every non-trivial link. So again, two pi square. And again, we have this conformal invariance. So we were able to prove a theorem jointly with Ian Agel and Andre Neves. So we proved that the conjecture is true. And we also proved the rigidity case. If, if a link has, the, has energy equal to 2 pi square, then the link must be conformal to the so-called standard Hopf link, which is a very simple link in S3 given by, this, by these expressions. So again, we had this conformal invariance so we can think about links in R3 or links in S3 instead. So that's the best link in S3. And if you ask the question, uh, what is the best realization of such a link in Euclidean 3 space, it turns out that the best thing to do is to do stereographic projection with respect to a point sitting in one of the curves. Because then this point goes to infinity, you see a straight line, and then the other curve becomes just a circle, you know, orthogonal to the line is centered with that guy. So that's the, that's the best link in, uh, in R3, if you want. So, so the proof of this, of this uses the same theory. Um, just summarizing here, the point is that this is a different problem, but there's a different family of surfaces, again, five-dimensional, with the property that the areas are now bounded by the Mabius energy instead of the Wilmer energy. And again, if the linking number is 1 or minus 1, we prove that the center map has non-trivial degree. <coughs> so the, the previous theory tells you that there must be a surface in the family with area at least 2 pi square. So somehow we found this, uh, this bridge between you know, the conformal world, where you, where, you worry, where you are interested in Wilmore energy or the Mabius energy, for example, and the Riemannian world, where you care about minimal surfaces and area. So this, this bridge is explained by the, by the minimax, minimax tool. I will skip this, just to mention some recent results that we have obtained and that we are very excited about. Uh, so a foundational question of Poincaré, Poincaré asks about the existence of closed geodesics on surfaces. Right, so I, I guess Poincaré was the first one to to, to, think about, to think about the problem. So given a closed surface, how, how does one construct a closed geodesic? So this is more interesting if your surface is S2, it's a two-sphere, because if your surface is a torus, for example, then you can just pick a non-trivial curve, and then you can minimize length, for example, in its homotopy class. Then you easily find a geodesic there. But if your surface is a two-dimensional sphere, there's nothing to minimize. So you have to to do a minimax process. And this was done by Birkhoff, who proved that this is always the case. So any, any two-dimensional sphere with any given geometry must contain at least one closed geodesic. And he did that by minimax methods. And later, this idea was exploited by, by several people. It actually led to the so-called lusternich neurman theory, whose one of the applications was this theorem that any metric on S2 contains at least three closed geodesics, three simple closed geodesics. And in the 90s, uh, independently, well, combining the results of Franks and Bangert, we actually, uh, they, they're actually able to prove that any metric on S2 contains infinitely many distinct closed geodesics. See also, Hingston, Hingston gave some estimate about the, the, how the, the, the number of geodesics grows with the length. So we know that for any metric on S2, there are infinitely many closed geodesics. So very recently, in joint work with Nevis, we have been able to prove that this is true in higher dimensions if you care about minimal surfaces. So if you have any compact Riemannian manifold with positive Ricci curvature, dimension n less than or equal to 7. So 7 here is natural if you, you know, this is a well-known issue about regularity of minimal surfaces. But anyway, includes a three-dimensional case, for example. Then we, have, we, have, we prove that any such manifold contains infinitely many distinct 
uh, closed embedded minimal hypersurfaces in, in M. And this settles a conjecture of Yao in the case of positive curvature. So Yao conjectures that any three-dimensional manifold must contain infinitely many um, minimal surfaces. I, I guess I don't have time to explain the ideas, but let me just mention that this uses families parametrized by projective spaces, which, which have been previously used by, previously studied by Gromov and, and Alan Guth. Okay, thank you. I'll finish here.